thank you so much for joining us. Really excited to talk with you today. So you, you have done and are doing incredible work at the intersection of technology and humanity through responsible AI. How do you define responsible AI and what are some of the biggest ethical issues you see kind of with the current state of AI? Uh, glad to be here, first of all. Second, yeah, I mean, responsible AI has come to actually mean a lot of different things. My specific focus, I'm a data scientist by background, so I like to, to like, what's fascinating to me is, as a social scientist and a data scientist, what's that in-between space? Like, how do we design and create technology that works to serve people, rather than thinking of trying to build technology that people have to then adjust around? Like, that would be like a high-level discussion. What I also have is responsibility, which is an interesting word, right? Because it's not necessarily compliance, right? Like, this is not just like, oh, are you adhering to the law? So the cool part about responsible AI or ethical AI or ethical use of technology is like, our job is to actually think ahead, right? And to think about the other harms that are happening that are not necessarily yet measured, measured or tracked or understood by law and adjusted by, by our existing institutions and framework. So it's a constantly evolving and growing field. There's always conversations that are super interesting happening. Um, and then the second part of your question was like, what are the big ethical issues today? Uh, wow, it's like, how long do you have, right? So I, I think largely it's just like accountability mechanisms. If I were to frame like, if I were to take every issue, like I can go into detail of what the specific issues we're talking about right now. I mean, the election's coming up. People are talking about uh, you know, how social media influences us, how much power social media companies have, right? Misinformation, deep fakes, like we can go on and on. But I think the meta level discussion is about accountability and governance. So quite literally, like the fear is not that, if, you know, if we scratch beneath the surface, like what are people worried about? What people are really worried about is like decisions are being made and we have no control over it and we are subject to them. And we only find out if we find out we find out later, we find out after the fact, after harms have been done, after someone's been manipulated, after the election is over, right? Um, so what we really call for is this idea of accountability. Uh, um, and also, you know, this, um, uh, it's like trustworthiness, like people talk about trustworthy AI, like what does that mean? So that's the part that interests me, like as a data scientist, I want to make things that are accountable, I want to create the systems of accountability, whether those are like automated data science tools, or whether those are like literally like interesting like governance methodologies and frameworks right by which we govern our systems um, so it means many different things fascinating and you said in a recent interview about silicon valley that kind of a critique that they were focusing on questions about what does their mommy no longer do for them could you talk a little bit about what you meant by that what kinds of problems do you think that silicon valley or people working in ai should be addressing um, so that was a bit of a tongue in cheek, but I, in, and I, and I, I was like, I, I wish I was one that coined that. It's definitely a phrase that's gone around before. Um, people use the phrase like nanny state, like not to mean nanny state in like the traditional big brother is watching you sense, but in like literally like someone needs to feed me. I don't want to clean my house. I need a ride. You know, these are the biggest companies in tech, right? Like everything I've just mentioned. Um, and what it, what it boils down to is, you know, we solve the problems that we think are important, right? We solve the problems that are important to us. And this is why when people talk about we need more voices in the room, we need different perspectives, the different kinds of people, that's actually why. And I'll give you a really great example. So I was in Norway over the winter and I needed to go somewhere and I was gonna walk there. And I brought up my maps on my phone and I was going there and like five minutes later, my phone completely bricked, like not even five minutes. Uh, and I had no idea what was happening. I just watched the battery power down and my phone just completely turned off. No idea what happened. I finally made it to the venue and everybody there was like, oh yeah, yeah, that happens. It's normal. And I'm like, I'm sorry, what? They're like, yeah, when it's really cold, your battery dies. And they all have these workarounds. Like some people have like battery, they like warmers they sell and blah, 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 you know? And it was interesting because I'm like, well, you know, I have a watch, right? Like I have my, my, my Apple watch or whatever, and it can tell me what stroke I'm swimming in the, like, you know, like that's insane. Like it's actually like mind blowing. My watch tell, can tell the difference between a butterfly and, and like a crawl, right? Or like a free, or like, you know, freestyle swim, but they can't make a phone that doesn't break in the cold. Um, and you know, you know what I'm saying? Like, and I have no idea about the technicalities of that issue. Maybe it is a really, really difficult issue to answer. I imagine it's also a very difficult question to answer of what impact, like, how am I swimming? But if you think about like what you choose to prioritize, well, these products are made 
in Cupertino, they're designed in Cupertino, California. Guess what is, is a question that is probably on people's minds in Cupertino, California, right? Like, oh, I go swimming a lot. How do I track that? And not, oh, it's minus 30 outside, my phone is breaking. Because if we were to prioritize those two problems, if someone actually experienced both of them, most likely you would prioritize your phone breaking. But if you live in Cupertino and it never gets below like 60 degrees Fahrenheit, you've never experienced it before. So a big part of like this idea of a nanny state is that, or the like, you know, the mommy state or whatever people call it, uh, it's really that, you know, we're solving the problems of like affluent young people or like very privileged young people, right? Um, people who, like, who went from home to college and now they're living on their own and they're like, oh, I don't want to cook. And it's not that, I, and I would rather pay the money to get the food delivered to me when I want it, you know, and these are, these are the problems of the privilege. Really interesting. Um, so I guess kind of building off that and thinking about how you address certain problems. So you were a global, global lead at uh, Accenture uh, Applied AI. What excited you about working at that space and kind of thinking about which problems and projects to focus on uh, in your work there? Yeah, um, so what I loved about that job is I sat on our applied AI team. So I, you know, I had clients I had to work with, I had to build products, I had to sell things to people and they had to want them, right? So my, my, and that's a challenge that I love, by the way. So my work in responsible AI is all about like, what are practical and pragmatic solutions that frankly people are willing to pay for that work in the market, in the market constraints. And, you know, so my work, so while I, while my team does do, did do research and we did, you know, publish a few papers, et cetera, our primary goal really was to create applied offerings. And I love that. I love that challenge. I love the idea that like, you know, I don't want to live in the world of theory. Like, wouldn't it be nice if everybody were nice to each other, right? Where I want to live in the world is like, well, people are sometimes not nice to each other. Um, how do we still make the world a marginally nicer place? Yeah, that's really cool. So you also kind of as an example of one of the projects that you worked on, the all.ai, um, which is uh, very cool and can kind of monitor gender imbalance in conversations in the workplace. Or it, could you talk a little bit about kind of what that was and why that was an interesting project for you? Yeah, so that was super fun. So in 2017, I was honored to be one of BBC's 100 women. And as part of that, they did things a little bit differently where they like filmed us and like followed us around for a week and we had like a project we had to build. So I got together with Natalia Margolis, who was another one of the awardees that year. And the two of us kind of brainstormed this like ethical AI or responsible AI solution to address um, gender imbalance in meetings. And we created uh, a tool that used voice recognition um, and it, it could sort of map every individual and how much they contributed to a conversation, how much people spoke, and you could even do some like easy sentiment analysis and give recommendations on like, oh, well, you know, you sounded nervous or you sounded this, like here are some tips on, on things you could do. Uh, interestingly, we never released it as a product um, and, you know, and definitely people were interested in it because uh, I was actually really worried about the ethical concerns of doing voice recording and sentiment analysis on people's work conversations. And this was funny because this was before we were even having these conversations. It just didn't seem like the right thing to do. Um, but, you know, it's an interesting concept, I think. I think if I were to be a strict data, like a legal adherent to data privacy law, actually nothing you say at work is legally yours. They can actually do what they want with that information. I just didn't necessarily want to be part of that. <laughs> Um, but you know, it was an interesting idea. Like, so, so I would say at a meta level, what I liked about the project was we're trying to use this technology to solve a social problem in a way that actually helps a human being's life be better, right? You're, you're helping people who, you know, and you think about in today's day and age in COVID, like everything happens on meetings on zoom or whatever. Right. Um, so a tool like that could actually be helpful to individuals who want to have a little bit more confidence, want to learn how to speak up a little bit more. Etc. In a way that's sort of non-confrontational and non-invasive. You also mentioned that you're starting a new uh, ethical AI startup. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that? What excites you? Why are you doing that? So Parity is the name of the company, um, and it's actually named after one of the statistical approaches to uh, determining to, to creating equalized outcomes, which is called predictive parity. Um, and that's, that's actually the first one of the first techniques that I had learned. So I kind of uh, the company is named after that. Um, 
So parity addresses a problem that I saw a lot of my clients and a problem a lot of companies have, which is it's hard for different types of teams to communicate with each other. Um, you know, and in part because when it comes to doing risk assessments or understanding artificial intelligence, what you're doing is you're taking like technical output and you're trying to explain it in a contextual setting, like a socially contextual setting. So, you know, a lot of, and, and even at Accenture, some of my first products were quantitative tools, right? And actually we've got no lack of quantitative tools available to us. There's so many things we can use. The problem actually is figuring out which tools are the appropriate ones, what's the appropriate approach. So when companies are trying to understand risk of the algorithms and AI that they're building, they, the problem is actually they don't know how to start. They don't know how to map the risk stream. And that's what Parity does. And of course, like a good data scientist, of course I'm gonna throw uh, some sort of a model at it. So we've created um, a model that's actually, we're patenting our process. Um, so I can't talk too much about it, but what I can say is, um, we built a graph model that actually uh, unearths um, the risk introduced by, you know, by your project. So it helps teams get the right kind of guidance in order to make good decisions. Um, we also create a way for different types of people to communicate um, and extract value. So how does a lawyer extract value from a data scientist output and vice versa, right? So we're, we're helping companies you know, like we're actually making like a DIY tool for companies to do algorithmic assessments and audits, and they can bring in expertise, et cetera. But, you know, it's, it, it's so that you don't have to hire, you know, expensive people um, to try to do sort of one-off audits of models. That sounds really awesome. Very cool. Uh, kind of at, at the meta level, what do you find some of the biggest challenges when you're thinking about creating startups or Kind of in any of your consulting work? Oh, wow. So just like in general? Yes, yeah, so just kind of at, in your job, what are some of the biggest challenges you face? Not necessarily the biggest challenges in the applied space. Let's see. I mean, I think the big thing right now is we don't really have standards for any of this stuff. So you can hire me and I'll just tell you kind of what, what I think. And I hope my opinion is worth something in the market or whatever, right? But at the end of the day, people are still doing one-off ad hoc analyses. And again, as a data scientist, nothing bothers me more. Um, we have no standardization. So if I were to audit, and be like, so even if you had, like if you hire somebody who's an amazing expert and they're doing an assessment, blah, 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 usually what happens is you hire a consultant they'll like hand you a report at the end of it. And you get this like big PDF, it's maybe like 40 pages or more actually sometimes. And that's great, but number one, it's like a snapshot in time, so you're not tracking this over time, and you haven't built a scalable way to do that. And the second problem is like, okay, how does that compare to this other model? Like if you have another model and you hired the same people, maybe another person to do an assessment of it, it's not apples to apples. So unless you know how you're talking about things, you have standards and guidelines and sort of uniformity around that, um, we can't actually compare. And let's say like on another end, let's say you have you know, you're hiring a vendor because you want to hire a company to use AI to help you source candidates for your job posting. How do you compare them in terms of like their ethical use, right? How do you do an audit? Uh, these are some really, big, really, really big problems facing companies. They actually don't know how to, how to answer these things quite yet. And kind of shifting gears a little bit more, could you talk a little about your trajectory into data science and AI? How did you get into this space? How did you get into the work you're doing now? Yeah, so I always like to say that I was not born of tech. Um, I do say it a lot on interviews. I get asked this question a lot. Um, I come from a public policy um, background. I was a statistician and I was an economist for a while. Um, and I worked at a consulting firm shortly, but it was mainly to do like predictive modeling um, for the pharmaceutical industry, right? So it's lots of math. Um, and then I went to my PhD program um, in political science at UCSC. So when I was at UCSC, I heard about this field called data science and the way I understood it was it's like, oh, you're gonna, you're gonna take models, like basically predictive models on and apply them to how products are built. Um, and you're gonna, so, you know, it's taking essentially human behavior data and you know, making predictions. And to me, that was a social scientist. I'm like, yeah, that's what quantitative social scientists do. Um, and the only difference really is that, you know, in my PhD program, if I, let's say, wrote a paper, it would be more retrospective. So you ask the question, 
what happens when, you know, treatment X happens? So we're like really big on experimental design. So we would say, you know, there were two school districts, one of them got extra funding, the other didn't. What was their impact over time? And you like write some, you run some sort of a regression model, right? So the way data science works, at least the way I understood it was it goes the other way around where it says, let's say you were to give money, right? Or like which school district needs the money or what are the, what are the factors influencing how this money is going to be spent? And using that, make an informed like data-driven decision on how to allocate money. And I'm like, cool, that's perfect, right? So instead of looking retro, like, because that's something that always bothered me about academia, I'm like, we look back and we're like, oh, snap, all this stuff happened. <laughs> Here's why. And we're like, cool, cool. How do we learn from that? So I, what I loved about data science was it was, it, was, it was perspective, right? It was looking into the future and saying, how do I give you the things you want that I think you want based on the other things you've bought in the past? That was like super cool. So that's actually why I came up to Silicon Valley. Uh, little did I know, like fast forward, what, like eight years, um, seven years, um, it would be like this whole different cultural revolution <laughs> happening within an entire industry. Wow, and kind of for students that are interested in data science and ethical AI kind of getting into it, do you have a, what would you recommend that they kind of look into course-wise or field-wise? Um, like any kind of starter kit for responsible AI or consulting that you have? Yeah, I mean, luckily if you're at MIT, there are a wealth of really amazing, brilliant people <laughs> literally right there. And th that was my favorite part of being at MIT, frankly. If I you know, look back on my time at MIT, and I do very, very fondly, I just think about how it's like you don't even realize until you leave how much amazing talent you are surrounded by. And it's not just amazing how they're like actually accessible people. So one thing I did realize from my counterparts at like other, you know, prestigiously tiered schools was that they didn't actually have the accessibility to these people that we did at MIT. You can just knock on someone's door and be like, hey, so I want to do a research project. And they'll be like, cool, let's get you some Europe funding. That actually doesn't exist at other schools. People are not that accessible. Like these like high tier fancy professors would never talk to an undergrad in most of the schools the way they would at MIT. One thing I really love about MIT is that like there are really accessible people out there. You can just reach out to them. Um, and there are a lot of folks who were who were and are still affiliated with the Media Lab. I know there was the entire debacle last year. Uh, definitely that was a huge discussion. But there are some really great people affiliated with that. Um, doing all sorts of work on ethical and responsible AI. I think Joy is still there. Joy is actually an investor in my company. So Joy and I are friends. Um, Algorithmic Justice League is doing great work. Um, and, and I know they just, you know, they're launching all sorts of really cool projects, really great stuff. Um, you know, and, and I think just like reach out and find the kinds of coursework. Um, there's a lot of folks talking about like, what does an ethical AI curriculum look like? I know it's part of the Schwartzman School. It's something that they're thinking of as well. Um, I don't know how hiring is going for any of that stuff, but you know, I, 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 what I would say is like there isn't one rule book and there isn't one way to do it. I think it's being solidified now at most universities. I think a lot of data science programs are thinking about how to incorporate ethics into what they do rather than like make all the programmers take a philosophy course, which is not how to do it. Um, I don't think it's a solved problem. But what I do think is that there are a wealth of amazing people at MIT, and for a lot of them, if you literally just drop them an email, uh, they will respond to you. I will say there's also a lot of grad students um, in the, I think it's the HAST program, Humanities, Arts, and Sciences, and Technology, I'm screwing that up, uh, who are quite literally focused on, on this work, and they're very active, they're very vocal on places like Twitter, et cetera, so you can definitely get involved. Oh, and there's also definitely like, underground student movements to introduce like ethical funding and things like that into MIT as well. So as usual in true MIT fashion, you'll, you'll find some underground hacky group doing something. Yeah, definitely. And kind of final question, do you have any parting advice for students at any institution um, kind of interested in these areas or going forward in technology? Yeah, um, that's a great question. So I get asked that a lot. And the thing is, it's such a new field. And I really wish that we all could say, oh, yeah, yeah, we're hiring lots of people, we're bringing on interns, blah, blah, blah. Or I know it may seem like there's a lot of us, but what I would say is usually in most organizations, it's a few people shouting really loudly. <laughs> uh, that's probably the best way I can explain it. Um, 
what's starting to happen is there are definitely more research opportunities. You're starting to see things like NERVS, the biggest AI conference, you know, pushing every paper submission to have an impact statement, like appreciating how their technology is impacting society. So we're going to see this movement pretty soon. I think the number one place you can look, and this is like maybe a little bit out of the box and interesting, are nonprofits, civil service organizations, right? There's groups that are out there. Um, and there are groups even in Boston that you could work with. I mean, AJL was one of them, but like definitely there's others out there. Um, and, you know, like it might be a good way to understand what kind of roles. Oh, I'd also definitely, uh, um, I, how could I possibly forget Berkman Klein, by the way? I don't know how I like completely blanked on like Shorenstein and Berkman Klein and all the amazing work being done by Joan and, and all the people out there. So whatever you're interested in, you can find someone working on it. Uh, people could always use someone to help them. And especially, you know, if it's an excited student, we get very excited about it. So if something you want you want to really pursue, I think right now a good way to do it is to reach out to a lot of the faculty and, you know, grad students kind of doing this and the people in companies who, you know, who maybe are, are starting to talk about it um, and, let, and just see what opportunities pop up. Awesome. Thank you so much for taking the time to interview today. It was really fascinating talking to you. Thank you. It was my pleasure.